years of life. Thank you so much for being here today for supporting Canadian AI. As you can see, we're not the only one. Very exciting. Great to see everyone here. This is a, a great opportunity to talk about uh, everything we've been doing, but mostly uh, all the exciting things to come. And uh, I know everyone here is a big, uh, big part of that, so it's great to be here. Awesome. So a bit of context to start. This is the third year we've done this conference. Um, Andrea and I had felt very lonely thinking about AI in our little corner for a while. In 2015, we decided to give it a shot, see if we could get a room together, and I think it was pretty lonely. We had the full teeth to get people here the first time, speakers. It was December, actually, right after you got elected, and we offered, people were like, oh, it's Canada, it's cool, why do we have to do this AI thing, why do we have to do it in Toronto? And, you know, I offered out bottles of brown liquor to keep people warm, and offered to name my first born child after a speaker to come to the keynote. So, you have to make good on that one one day. But, um, you know, Jay and I were remarking on the fact that we have to convince people to think about this. And now, you know, especially since you got elected, you can't help but be bombarded by AI at a front and center. So I'm going to start by going back a little bit, though. Jay and I were talking about, you know, when was the first time that we really started thinking about artificial intelligence? And so I wanted to ask you the same question. When was that, and what were you thinking about? Oh, um... I think I, I got into it through, through sci-fi, like most of us did, whether it was um, Asimov's Three Rules of Robotics or um, looking at that, you know, watching war games and thinking about global thermal nuclear war versus a nice game of the test. Um, you know, well, you know, it, was, it was just getting a, a, a sense of uh, computers that would be smart, and that was the big thing about war games, right? Yeah. Where where you know we taught computers to learn, and I thought, oh, well, that's really really interesting. And I remember as a kid playing uh, chess on my Mac in the in the eighties, and there was a, a de degree of difficulty setting that you'd actually set based on how much time you let the computer compute, uh, and it 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 was I think, my vision of it anyway, it was allowing the computer to go deeper and deeper into all the different possible you know, decision trees, all the different moves that it could make and to figure out the very best one. If you give it just one second, or five seconds, or ten seconds, it would go a lot deeper and, and get much more difficult or advanced moves. And that was sort of me thinking about, whereas I was never a very good chess player, but I, you know, my, my moves were two steps. One, look if I'm in immediate or imminent danger anywhere on the board. And then go with my gut. Uh, and, and like I said, never a very good chess player. Uh, but now to see how things have evolved into uh, computers, because of the work of Jeff Hinton and others uh, on deep learning, doing that gut step a little more uh, tangibly than just what is the perfect logical uh, logical step is amazingly excited, but also. Uh, challenging for us to think about in an ethical and moral frame, but also as a legislator and as, a, as someone who's trying to build uh, a frame for us to succeed in a safe and fair world, um, there's, there's a little too much black box thinking in there for us to be totally comfortable with. So I hear you're an expert in quantum computing. <laughs> <laughs> Given that you know, these neural networks are deep learning was kind of pioneered very close to here, Canadians are being forced figure out what artificial intelligence is, what neural networks are. So can you give us a little bit of a problem? Uh, yeah. Anyone in this room knows more about uh, AI than I do, right? Uh, it's just, it, for me, it's understanding that a computer can make, uh, in a video game or in a simulation, uh, massive numbers of experiments to try, if I do this, what result do we get? Okay, if I do that, what result do we get? Whether it's solving a problem or you know, following a car down a road or whatever it is, computers are allowed to experiment basically so much faster than anyone can. I mean, a, a, a doctor will see you know, many thousands of patients in you know, the course of their career and uh, develop an extraordinary level to uh, analyze and understand what's wrong with someone, but a computer can do uh, that many uh, tests and, and simulations uh, in a few minutes or in seconds, uh, and you know, there's, there's a capacity to accumulate data and, and experimental paths. And that's sort of the, the machine learning element of AI, where you try all sorts of different things and figure out what works and what doesn't. And for simple things, that's reasonably um, effective. 
but where uh, I feel like I'm getting tested. <laughs> <laughs> but where <laughs> but what's really exciting is taking that step that simulates a little more the way the brain works, where we don't work in perfectly linear algorithms in our head, logical steps. Uh, we make leaps of intuition, leaps of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of analysis based on experiences, based on, I, I think about it in terms of you know, what I studied at university, which was poetry, and trying to explain why a poet wrote a particular line. And you get really into analyzing, oh, did he mean death? Was he talking about his mother in there? <laughs> you can go back and take an interview with, with, with the poet who say, no, no, I didn't mean any of those things. You're completely wrong. But the poet could be wrong because maybe they didn't know what they were packaging into that line. They just knew that that line felt right. It was the right message for them on an intuitive, on an artistic level. And therefore, there's always more to be hidden in there. So mimicking that leap of intuition of patterns with the forward loops and then recursive loops as we're starting to develop within those hidden layers uh, is really, really exciting. But also, as I mentioned, lend us to a place where maybe the computer can't justify the decision it's taking, or we can't explain why a particular decision was taken. Take, take the example of self-driving cars that everyone's thinking about now. Um, if you're stuck in, a, in an emergency situation and you have to choose between veering into oncoming traffic or uh, risking to hit the little girl that ran out into the street after her with the ball, you're going to you know, struggle and you're going to make one decision. And if 10 minutes later the police officer is grilling you on why you made that decision, you won't no, it's instinct. Will you be held accountable for it? Probably not if it was a reasonable decision that anyone in a high-stress situation could make. Well, self-driving cars might have to make the same, will have to make the same kinds of decisions. What is going to be our expectations of what is the right decision? And how accountable are they for the right decision? And how did they come to that right decision? Can we check every step of the program to see that they came to the right decision. Can we charge the programmer, or can we charge the, the, the coder that missed out the line of code? Or do we say, no, the computer made a leap of judgment? Well, that's something that's challenging for us to try and figure out how to think around in a legal, moral, ethical framework. And all I can say is, I'm glad we're having the reflections around AI here in a country where we have a charter of rights and freedoms, where we have a decent ethical and moral frame to think about these consequences and these contexts and the benefits of diversity and all the things that we do well in Canada, um, because there's some parts of the world where uh, those decisions wouldn't be as top of mind, and, and I'm glad we're having this conference yeah. here today. So do you think 